And welcome to the Bitcoin Show, episode 9,000, or how many episodes is it? I forget. I have lost track. We've 13. had so many shows this week, this month. It's, it's internet time. We're working at internet speed. And, uh, you know, I'm Bruce Wagner. And I'm Ed Gell. And today with us we have Stefan Thomas, live from Switzerland. Are you skiing in the mountains right now, or are you? Where do you live? Uh, no, right now I'm on your show, but uh, oh. you know, uh, I could go swimming in the lake after. See, <laughs> see, that's the answer of a true technical person. He's going to give you a technical answer. He's not actually skiing at this moment, <laughs> although you could be. You could be if you have good 4G up there, <laughs> or 5G. So, <clears throat> Stefan, Stefan is creator of WeUseCoins.com, which is probably the mo most popular video on the internet about what is a Bitcoin. Right. And yeah. uh, uh, we wanted to, to get you on because I know that that's how people will know of you, but you're involved in so many aspects of Bitcoin. How, for, let's start with this. How, well, wait, let's start with this mm -hmm. because <clears throat> I need to thank our sponsors who make this show possible, right? We really, really appreciate them. We love you all and we love our sponsors. And if you like the show, please call up our sponsors and thank them for supporting us. Carpe Viam, video marketing, seize your market, say it with video, C-A-R-P-E-V-M.com. Carpe Viam does web video marketing. They are professionals. They'll help you write the script and make you look great. And they'll create a video specifically for your website to sell what you're selling and uh, make you look like a pro. And Mezzi Grill. Authentic Mediterranean food meets modern flavor at Mezzi Grill, M-E-Z-E grill.com. That's our buddy Marwan, the best food. We met him because we love the food. That's how we met the owner. And that's how he became uh, a sponsor. And that's how he became the first restaurant in the world that we know of that accepts Bitcoin. <laughs> and why he's been interviewed by Routers and uh, Al Jazeera English and everybody uh, because uh, he accepts Bitcoin and so on. Mezzi Grill, support them. Uh, thank them for supporting us and tradehill.com of course tradehill.com are the, the the new exchange site online where you can buy and sell bitcoins instantly in a flash and super super easy with so many options to get money in and out of it um, tradehill.com you'll get 10% off of the fees their fees which are actually very very small anyway and smaller than the competition uh, but you get 10% more off of that for life if you use the referral code for the Bitcoin show, which is, uh, stands for Trade Hill Referral, TH-R141. And that's on your screen, TH-R141. We thank Trade Hill for sponsoring us and U.S. Gold Coins. U.S. Gold, <clears throat> US Gold Coins com is the company founded by Andy Gauss, who is the host of uh, The Real World of Money. You'll see uh, Wednesday mornings at 10 a.m. Eastern Time, starting real soon now. Um, he's already got like millions and millions of listeners on his radio show, and he's moving it over to only one TV and, and uh, creating a TV show. But we know Andy because he is uh, an awesome, awesome trusted advisor for excellent <laughs> investments in rare U.S. silver and gold coins. So if you want to diversify, you don't want to hold all your, your you know, coins in one basket, <laughs> so to speak, um, not just Bitcoins. If you want to buy gold and silver coins, he's the man. He really, truly is the world-renowned expert, in my opinion. And uh, we wouldn't have anyone who isn't, uh, who we don't absolutely believe in. So usgoldcoins.com, yeah, thank Andy Gauss for, for sponsoring us. All right, so back to Stefan. <laughs> Sorry for that blatant commercial. No worries. But, it's great uh, that you have so many sponsors. It means that uh, the show is healthy and doing well. And well, I'm a big fan myself. I signed up with your referral code as well at, at Twitter. Oh, oh, thank you. Thank you, Stefan. You know, we so appreciate everybody in the Bitcoin community. And you're right about that. We had, you know, we, we launched this network. We had three sponsors, which were all three buddies of mine. You know, Marwan at Mezzi Grill, Charlie at Carpe Viam, and uh, Andy at US Gold Coins. And they said, Bruce, Ed, we'll sponsor everything you do, whatever you do, we're, we're, you know, count us in. And that, was, <laughs> and that was what enabled us to get this studio. So we, now we have the whole fifth floor on Fifth Avenue Studio. We have real TV studios. <laughs> so that's what enabled that. But then one of the first shows we started with was the Bitcoin show. OMG. <laughs> That's going to be my catchphrase. Oh my God. Anyway, um, but what happened is we got like six more sponsors who wanted to do just the Bitcoin show and the El Show, the Bitcoin in Spanish, and they just keep coming in. This morning, I checked my email. I'm so excited. You can tell. <laughs> I checked my email this morning and I got two more sponsors. 
So we had to bump up our rates a little bit because we just have, we only have so many spots and we're doing it six days a week now, five days a week in English and one in Spanish. So we just got two more sponsors uh, that are coming aboard and uh, it's fantastic. It's wonderful that, you know, there be, and it's because there's so many Bitcoin startups. This is such an exciting time to be alive, right? I mean, it's just amazing. Bitcoin hasn't even had a hiccup in the price. You look at it, Trade Hill and Mt. Gox, I was just looking at it, they're like pennies apart. It's so stable. Mm -hmm. It's almost exactly the same price as it was before the Mt. Gox hack. And they say Bitcoin is over. I don't think so. Not I don't think even so. close. <laughs> so tell us, Stefan, now I'm going to let you get a yeah. word in. How did you discover Bitcoin and when was that? Um, I first heard about Bitcoin through the website StumbleUpon, uh, and that was in June 2010. Mm -hmm. And uh, I sort of looked at it, and uh, I was already, you know, very, let's say, open and very positive uh, uh, about the idea. But I didn't really have time or, or you know, the interest to, to get very deeply involved. Um, but I sort of monitored it. I learned about it, read the wiki, you know, lurked in the forums. And then when I, uh, um, in, uh, in early 2011, I saw the bounty about the uh, animated movie. And that's when I thought, you know, I, I've been, a, you know, marketing um, a project manager in, in London. Uh, that was my, you know, job for one and a half years. Uh, so I thought, you know, why not go ahead and, uh, um, and uh, make a video and just uh, call up some context, you know, see if we can't put something together. And that's how, you know, We Use Coins came about. That's wow, awesome. so many things. That was like yeah. the beginning of the story and the end of the story kind of like left out the middle because there's a whole year. But the beginning yeah. of the story <laughs> was because I got so much to say about all these things. The beginning of the story, how much was Bitcoin? Six tenths of a cent, right? Yeah, yeah, but I didn't invest back then, unfortunately. I only invested in, in December. And you didn't well, sell all your personal belongings and your clothing and everything to buy Bitcoin at that time? <laughs> no, I don't know. <laughs> no, and how, what was the bounty for what you were looking at at that time? Um, the bounty, uh, as posted, was um, you know a bit complicated because there's lots of different people involved. What we right. eventually got was uh, 9,052 bitcoins. Whoa! Wow! Hello. That's you know, then that awesome. wasn't. By the way, but that was not in July. That was <laughs> no, this, early this year, mm -hmm. and I remember that thread very, very mm -hmm. well. And um, yeah, it was it was about uh, worth uh, 70, 74 cents a coin back then. 74 cents a coin. Wow. I hope you held on to them, but I won't ask that. That's a personal question. But, but, but let, me, let me say this. I remember that thread very, very well. And in fact, I was like, yes, this is so yes, needed. This is I so remember. needed. And I didn't know, I mean, I knew somebody would do it. Lots of people would probably do it. But in fact, I contacted um, Nina Paley. I don't know if you've probably never heard, maybe not if you've heard of her, but Nina Paley has, uh, is an animator who um, mm -hmm. created this amazing full length feature animated film called Nina Sings, no, Sita. Sita, Sita Sings the Blues. Right. Nina created Sita. So anyway, right. Sita Sings the Blues, and it's really, really, really fun, cool, animated film. It's a full feature-length film. And, um, Free open source, by well, the way. Yeah, but it didn't start that way. It was, a, it was a Hollywood film kind of idea, and she was going to try and sell it for distribution and theaters and all that stuff. But when she got in, she had so many battles, legal battles, about uh, intellectual property rights to these old mm -hmm. songs from the 1920s that were locked up, that were owned by huge companies like Sony and stuff, and nobody would even return her calls, much less mm -hmm. give her their permission. So finally, she just, the whole experience turned her into an advocate for free open source, which is mm -hmm. a whole other thing. We actually have a show called The Free Culture Show, so okay. stay, stay tuned for that coming up. It's one of our 31 shows we're rolling out uh, over the coming weeks. But The Free Culture Show is all about free open source everything architecture, animation, education, awesome. software, everything. I mean, we're on the cutting edge, you know. This is only only one TV because we're we're all only one. We're all connected. So, all right. So back to this. <laughs> uh, what was the point? Oh yeah, Nina. The bounty. <laughs> oh, I tried to get a hold of Nina. I emailed her and I said, "You should do this film. You should do this animated film because, you know, she could probably do it in her sleep." But I'm so glad you did. You did a fantastic job. Yeah, incredible. I loved it. The thing is that, that I one of the the it's not really a criticism because I know you're a developer. You're a hardcore developer. We'll get to that in a minute. But I saw in it that, you know, because I'm coming from BitcoinMe.com, the Bitcoin for Dummies, you know, mm -hmm. uh, I want Fred and Margin to understand. That's the first site that where I, I thought I understood Bitcoin was BitcoinMe.com. Yeah. Great site. Oh, wow. <laughs> That's great. I'm so glad. It's, it's, it's all synergistic, right? We give and learn and, mm -hmm. I mean, give and receive and learn and uh, mm -hmm. teach all the time constantly. Well. The thing that threw me a little bit was the mining. I mean, I understand it, and it was it was very well done. 
Uh, but it, I think it, it really was so much information that you were trying to get into a little tiny video that, and probably someone, uh, that was probably part of the bounty, I'll bet you. Now that I think about it, it was probably somebody said, make sure you explain how mining works. I don't know. But the mining no, no, part um, the, threw people basically for Basically, when, when we started the video, we consulted with, you know, the people I knew from, from marketing, done TV spots and so on before. You know, mm -hmm. personally, I didn't uh, do very much. I just uh, sort of got everybody together. I, I fronted some of the cash. And so, um, you know, it's not really, I can't really claim uh, to be the, the <laughs> brain behind it, but, uh, you know, sort of the facilitator, if you will. And so what people told us immediately was, you know, you can't explain it in, in just this, this web viral video format, but what you can do is make people interested. Right. And so what we did was we focused on um, several things. Um, first, the, um, the advantages, the concrete advantages that it has. Then in the second part of the video, we sort of try and explain a little bit about the technology, but just to give a taste, if you will. Mm -hmm. And then the final part, we sort of look at the, the impact that it might have. You know, it might completely change the market. Um, and finally, you know, just an appeal to people um, like merchants and people who are freelancers, you know, why they should accept it, why it's a good idea to, to make yourself known in the Bitcoin community and get some extra business. Well, it doesn't hurt, right? Yeah. Um, and that, that's basically the approach that we had. So it was very, very, let's say, deliberate. You know, mm -hmm. So everything in the video is, is you know, we'll put a lot of thought into every yeah. single second. Of it. Yeah, well, it did tell. that. I mean, it, it definitely piqued interest, especially a lot of journalists. I noticed because I've had a lot of these, I've had a lot of contact with a lot of journalists, and I noticed the first thing that's always on their screen is weusecoins.com, and they they've watched the video. They probably watched the video a hundred times. They still don't really have a clue what a Bitcoin is, but they're <laughs> so intriguing. You know, they're like, wow, something about mining, something about mm -hmm. processing, making it out of thin air. They just, they think they're probably, uh, you know, even they're intrigued and it, it inspires them to research it more. So that's really, really good. One, one of the things, was, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, I was doing a, a piece with uh, um, an, a journalist from uh, South China. And uh, he said that, you know, the first thing he saw about Bitcoin was the video and he immediately shared it with his friends. And then from there, he was, you know, quite friendly uh, about how he was going to write his story. So it was, you know, really positive that people sort of, especially from the press side or from the mainstream side, you know, for them, the video is, is quite something tangible that they, they can uh, get their hands around. Exactly. It's, it's amazing. Video is so powerful, as we know. The, um, in fact, uh, the, uh, we have some associates who are in uh, old media television commercials, and um, they learned about Bitcoin through us, and they want to, they, they're actually very famous television producer, uh, commercial producers, and they okay. have said that they want to create an actual old media television commercial promoting Bitcoin. You mm -hmm. know, yeah, that's um, needed. Because, you know, there's enough out there about Scientology and so on. We, need <laughs> we can do something better than that. So um, we want to create a television commercial that actually explains what Bitcoin is in a, in a really short commercial, but have, have it actually broadcast on mainstream, uh, you know, old media television, all the networks, mm -hmm. across all the networks. So mm -hmm. we're working on a project for that. So that's going to be really exciting. Um, and, it, and again, it's mainly just to tell them the basics and where to go for more information. You know, that's the thing. If people can get as technical as they want, there's no limit, you know, but um, just use Google. But people, for me, from my uh, viewpoint, people really need to know the basic, basic ideas first. Yeah. You know, some people yeah. say, well, in order to understand Bitcoin, you first have to understand elliptical curve cryptography, la, 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 la. You know, and as soon as you get it, it's like, whoa, they, whoa, whoa. They also, sorry to interrupt you, but they, they also need this, this basic motivation, right, to, to even sit down and spend time on it, right? Because everybody has heard about, you know, these uh, dot-com uh, currencies, and it's also something that, you know, comes up in interviews a lot. Right. You know, when you, when you talk to journalists, and the first thing they say is, you know, how is this different? How is this a different currency? Mm -hmm. And I think if you can get that point across, you know, they will find the information for themselves. It's just that you have to get the point across that it's something new, that's something different. Exactly. That's what I do too. Whenever I do an interview, I, always, I start with the five things that make this absolutely unique in the mm -hmm. history of mankind. There's never been a currency that was completely decentralized. There was, there's never been a currency that was absolutely limited to 21 million or less than 21 million bitcoins. And infinitely divisible. You got whenever you say it's limited in quantity, you also have to explain the divisible part because then they're like, oh, well, there will be a shortage if there's only 121 million. How could you possibly have enough of them? You know, mm -hmm. and and I don't have enough money to buy a whole Bitcoin. You know, <laughs> and things like that. Mm -hmm. So you have to explain the divisibility and then hand in hand with the limitation and the zero transaction fees. The you know the uh, irreversible nature of it that it's not um, it, there's no such thing as a chargeback. All those benefits that are make it absolutely unique and 
virtually indestructible as far as we know. Even if the uh, number one online exchange that's got 90% market share is hacked and, and all the accounts are Everything published works, on the yeah. internet. I mean, it's still, oh, it doesn't even, barely a glitch, barely a blip in the price. I mean, you know, people say, oh, the price plummeted to a penny. That's such nonsense. You know, well, you heard me say this before. But uh, I want to I ask you now, there, I know that you're involved in um, a lot of other projects too, and haven't you been, uh, what's your connection with the app development and the Google code for the Bitcoin client? Yeah, um, that's actually, I got uh, a shout out, I think on your first show from Andrew Schaff, and uh, I was working with him. Uh, on an Android-based uh, client, right? Mm -hmm. And so basically what I was working on was the server side for that. So there's a lot of been, been a lot of talk about uh, a lightweight implementation. Uh, Satoshi's paper even has a, a, a whole section on simplified payment verification. Mm -hmm. And the other person you have to mention in that respect is Mike Hearn, who's been sort of my uh, intellectual influence in all of this. Like he's mm -hmm. been the one who's introduced me to Bitcoin in, from a technical perspective and, and in depth. Mm -hmm. um, when we went to, to all the meetups here in Switzerland. Mm -hmm. And uh, so basically what I'm working on is a server that can um, look into the, uh, the blockchain for you so you don't have to have a whole copy of the blockchain. That's pretty much all it does. And uh, because Bitcoin itself is just a cryptographic set of, of uh, uh, basically checks, if you will, right? There's, mm -hmm. It's like a, a Bitcoin transaction is like a check that I send you. And if you can look at the signature and the signature is valid and the server tells you that yes, this transaction is actually unspent and right. it is actually in the blockchain, um, then you know that this check is valid. So you don't right. have to trust the server with your money, actually. Right. You just have to trust it to give you accurate information about the blockchain. Right. And actually, you can have a, a fairly low privilege server right. and uh, uh, fairly lightweight clients around it. Yeah, I understand what you're saying because really it's just like, um, I guess in, a, in an old, old, <laughs> old tech uh, analogy might be where you call up and check your balance in your checking account and it's telling you your mm -hmm. balance. Well, if, if they told you your balance was more than it really was, it's not the end of the world because what it comes down to is you might write a check but it won't clear. I mean, it's, it's mm -hmm. the, the, the clearing of it is the, in the cryptography. So the, the, uh, the, uh, assuming it or assimilating it into the ledger is the cryptography. But ju that's just checking your balance to make sure you've got the money to spend, which is important. But it's not, uh, it's not really that critical because if you don't have the money, it isn't going to be spent anyway, right? Yeah, you can also ask multiple servers and just see if they all give you the same answer, right? Mm -hmm. um, so if you, have, uh, if you don't trust the server very much or you're especially paranoid, just ask 10 servers. And if one of them differs, then you know something's up there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the point of this, so, so that those of you who may not know <laughs> what, why this matters, is because um, they're talking about the Android app, the uh, smartphone apps that need to be really thin. They don't need to actually constantly connect to the internet. They don't need to have the whole entire blockchain on the phone you only need the balance and, and you basically press a button and it checks the balance. It just goes out and has a server check it for you so that that is um, off, offloaded, that processing and that connectivity is offloaded to an actual server and the phone just does the cryptography, only what it needs to do. So it makes it a client server kind of a, a relationship that makes it much more efficient for use on a smartphone, right? Right. And the one application that, uh, that I've been involved in developing as well as uh, uh, Bill Kasserine and uh, I don't know the, the, the name of the other person, but you can look it up on GitHub uh, who our contributors are. Um, sorry to, to whoever it is. <laughs> I'm, so, I'm sorry. Um, but the, what, we've been, what we've been working on in terms of an application is uh, basically a browser-based application um, that you know, doesn't have any, uh, you know, doesn't require any kind of installation. And the beautiful thing about that is that you can run it on every smartphone. So um, basically what, what I'm announcing right now is, is um, a Bitcoin support on the iPhone, no matter what Apple says or does, we're mm -hmm. going to be able to make it work as a web application. Like Little Britain, you know, have you ever seen this comedy sketch things from Little Britain where they say, uh, computer says no. So I always say, no, Steve Jobs says no. Mm -hmm. No peer to peer, no, 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 no money mm -hmm. unless I get 30%. <laughs> yeah. Nothing to do with yeah, money. I mean, no, the, no, no. the iPhone has really good web application support, so you can yeah. get really nice interface, you mm -hmm. know, really nice experience for the user. Yeah. Um, and the only thing you really need is basically JavaScript based cryptography. And right. uh, that's what we've written, and that's, that's already released as open source on uh, bitcoinjs.org. Mm -hmm. So, and isn't that, uh, is that the Google developer who created that? Or does that have to something Sorry? to do with Google? The, the uh, bitcoinjs, was that the one that was developed by Go someone at no, Google? No, no, no. 
Um, uh, yeah, it's a lot of confusion, and uh, I, I think maybe I should have picked a different name, but uh, there's a difference between uh, JavaScript, which is JS, mm -hmm. and Java. And so what Mike's been working on, Mike works at Google, mm -hmm. um, what Mike's been working on is Bitcoin J, which mm -hmm. is exciting for its own reasons. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, it's basically a Java library for Bitcoin, which is great for like, you know, servers or also lightweight clients, especially on Android, it's a great library for that. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's been working on that. I've been working on a JavaScript implementation, which is you know, different mm -hmm. you know, technology, if you will, mm -hmm. but you know, for different applications, basically. So it's, it, but they're both, um like overlapping, they would both be for a similar purpose, but just two different languages, two different platforms. Yeah, they're also, they're also technically similar because um, Mike's code is probably the best documented and best commented uh, mm -hmm. implementation of Bitcoin right now. Mm -hmm. So if you're planning to write your own Bitcoin client, I have highly, highly recommend you look at Bitcoin J because that's, that's where you can learn how the protocol really works and so well, on. Well, let me ask a stupid question then. Why, why didn't you just use Bitcoin J instead of creating Bitcoin JS or is, that, or is there a need for something different? Right. Um, the thing with the browser is the only thing that it really runs well is JavaScript. So mm -hmm. um, if you want to run the client side in the browser itself, mm -hmm. then the only option you really have is uh, JavaScript. And as for the server side, that was basically just a, I don't know, personal preference, if mm -hmm. you will. I, I wanted to develop something with Node.js, which is a very interesting new platform that's up and coming for, you know, uh, real-time web development, and it seemed a good fit for this particular problem. Okay. Uh, the only thing that was missing, obviously, was a Bitcoin library for it. Um, so I thought, you know, I might just okay. go ahead and uh, write it. And when you say the browser, you're you're spe you're especially uh, thinking of the this the standard browser on an iPhone, is that right? Uh, yeah, yeah. Obviously, uh, that's where we have a big advantage. As long as uh, Apple doesn't allow any apps on that platform, um, you know the. Mm -hmm. Webcoin will probably be the only way to, mm -hmm. to do Bitcoin on, on iPhone. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, unless you uh, jailbreak it, obviously. Right. Um, but that's just a, I see it as a temporary solution. I think that eventually, if Bitcoin spreads further, they're going to have to allow yeah. uh, an, a Bitcoin app on it. Yeah, eventually Steve backs down once he's forced to by, by some governments exactly. or the European Union or the US or something. Nothing, but, nothing against Steve, you know, a big fan of Apple. But, oh, yeah. Um, I love Macs you know, and iPhones. Just sometimes sometimes just they're Apple. a little bit, you know slow to move, I guess. Yeah. I mean, it's Apple's, Apple's corporate, you know, philosophy that I, is so proprietary that a lot of people are opposed to, but um, the product design... It's not a limitation from the hardware, like, as far as the thin client, the limitation as far as how many, how much memory the hardware has, and is that the reason why you have, you don't want the, the whole blockchain? Yeah, um, especially when you're using um, just web app technologies, so web application technologies. Um, you run into some pretty tight limits in terms of what you can actually yeah, run on the system itself. Yeah. For example, the official client generates 100 addresses in advance. Mm -hmm. uh, if we tried to do that on an iPhone in JavaScript, the application would take five minutes just to do that. Right? Mm -hmm. um, so we had to really strip it down to the bare bones. It's going to be you know, pretty much not uh, unnoticeable for the user, um, but it really does only what's necessary. So it'll yeah. only generate an address when you actually click uh, generate address. It won't have its own blockchain. It will rely on the server for that. But we talked about that. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I mean, that's, that's pretty much the two limitations or the two concessions that we had to make in terms of the, the implementation. Mm -hmm. And just in terms of the, the uh, release, it's first going to com come out for uh, you know, regular web browsers on the PC. Uh, it's going to be sort of like Insta Wallet uh, with uh, the difference that your coins are actually stored on your own computer. Um, instead of on the server, so that's sort of our differentiating, you know, uh, or the difference there. And um, later, when when it comes out, uh, we can make a, a, an interface just for mobile phones. It'll, it's going to run on pretty much every mobile phone you can think of that mm -hmm. that has a you know modern smartphone browser. Right. So the okay, so the, yeah, so the two limit. Let me just re re review to make sure I get this right. So the two main limitations are one is Apple's corporate philosophy that doesn't allow anything to do with money unless they get thirty percent or not at all if it doesn't go through the normal banking. And so that's, they're blocking it from the market. And the other is the actual, the fact that it's, it will, and, and, and that uh, Google has run into that with Google Voice and, and Skype and many things have run into that barrier where um, they just say no. Apple says no, mm -hmm. <laughs> there's no way around it. So you, the, what Google did the same thing with Google Voice, they created a web-based app right. and then it works in the web-based app and it works almost as well. And, um, Which I actually like better, even on my Android phone, using the, the web-based web app better. 
Uh, believe it or not. <laughs> I don't, but anyway, it's okay. It, at least it works. At least mm -hmm. iPhone users also can benefit from some of these apps. And uh, mm -hmm. even if it is through the browser. So it's basically it's a workaround to work around Steve Jobs. <laughs> but the, uh, yeah, the other... But I, I, honestly, I wouldn't think of it that way. I mean, it, it makes it sound like it's uh, you know, a hack. You know, it's not going to work very well. Mm -hmm. But it's like the browser on the iPhone is actually really, really good. It's, it's mm -hmm. the same that's used on Android and, and, and some other platforms as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, it's excellent technology. It's completely brilliant. And mm -hmm. you can get uh, an experience that's virtually indistinguishable, essentially. Well, that's great then. And if it's really that good, it could be superior in that you don't need an app. So you can use it on an Android phone too, of course. Exactly, yeah. You don't need to install anything. You just enter the, the URL, which uh, I'm not going to announce just yet. But mm -hmm. uh, um, yeah, you're just going to enter the, the URL. Maybe you can have me on again when we launch it. And then once we you've entered the URL, you, it opens up, it loads <laughs> up, it gives you a sort of a welcome screen. Um, we did sort of a pre, um, preview screencast about it. Mm -hmm. You can Google for that. Uh, if you Google for WebCoin screencast, you'll probably find it. And uh, you can cast. sort of look at how the, the interface looks on the PC. And uh, we've since made some changes to it, and uh, it's all open source, so you can you can look at the code too if if, if that's your thing. Nice. Very cool. Thank, Thank you for that. No, by what the about? Way. Yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> you guys are awesome. <laughs> well, don't man. don't think I mean, it's, it's a it's a team effort. So yeah. you know, Andrew has been involved in that. Uh, I have to mention Eric Brigham, who has been very supportive. Uh, he's the uh, founder of TrueCoin. Yes. Um, which is another startup uh, in mm -hmm. the Bitcoin realm. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Honestly, I have too many people to mention. I'm not yeah. good with names. No, so, I know. You know just look on the websites, and I'm going to credit everybody. Um, so yeah, check that's it out. the wonderful and, thing and don't about the, give me all the credit. <laughs> the Bitcoin community and the open source community, which are kind of completely overlapping communities, it's really almost one and the same in many many aspects. But everybody chips in, and they do what they do best, and then they all build on each other's work, and it just becomes this. Um, synergistic uh, steamroller that just uh, is changing everything. The way yeah, the whole incredible. world deals with money in internet speed. This is happening so fast. Yeah, and I noticed that the the difference between you know I, I'm also uh, a team manager and I, I also work full time, right? And uh, there I have to get through all this red tape in order to get anything done. So with what I, what takes eight hours at my normal job, you know, it takes one hour if I'm doing it in the afternoon or, or in the evening for Bitcoin, you know? So mm -hmm. it's incredible. As soon as you remove all these, in, sorry, in, uh, these institutional barriers, if you will, yes. right? and you have this, this open culture, you, know, can, you can get things done so fast. And at the same time, it's not, you know, it's not communism or anything. It's like we're all interested in making mm -hmm. money with it. We're just cooperating at it. It's That's just, right. It's a great way. It's the future. It's absolutely the future. That's why we have the Free Culture Show, because it's about that. People haven't even heard of what is free culture. They don't even know. And, but they don't know about, they, many people don't know about Bitcoin, and we're, we're here to educate them. And the same thing with free culture. We're, they don't know what that is. They don't, even people mm -hmm. in the community sometimes don't even know that term yet. But we're here to educate them. So we're going we're gonna to be talking about a lot of that well, stuff. Thanks. It's so <laughs> awesome. It's so yeah. awesome. We it's can never great. thank you enough, honestly. So the... Uh, the one thing, a technical question about that, when you're, when you're using the, uh, the JavaScript in the browser, whether it's on Android, mm -hmm. iPhone, or whatever, and even a PC, you can use this, right? On any, any browser, pretty much, that runs JavaScript, right? Is yeah. the, um, w how does it store the wallet, and where is it actually stored? Okay. Um, yeah, there has been uh, a lot of progress uh, in recent years um, in terms of you know what, technologies that specifically support applications that run the browser. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the technologies that came along with HTML5 is called local storage, and uh, what that does is it's basically like a cookie except that it doesn't get sent to the server on every request, right? Um, so if you if you would store your private keys in a cookie, it wouldn't really help you because every time you open a web page, it would be sent to the server, so the server would have access to it. Right. But with local storage, that's no longer the case. So you can uh, actually create an application where the um, all the dynamic stuff, basically the server that has the blockchain on it, is a different system than the server that has all the static files on it. And what that means, because you can uh, make a static server much much more secure than any server that runs you know, PHP or any dynamic uh, scripting stuff on it, mm -hmm. um, you can have sort of a you know, much higher level of security because people are getting the, um, the actual trusted files, the, the software, from this secure server. They can even store these files on their own computer and they have like a, like a normal client with the same uh, security properties as the official client, right? Mm -hmm. um, and they can have that on their own computer and then they can use these web services for you know, convenience and ease of use. And again, I want to point out that our application, the, the web browser-based application, <coughs> is one 
possible uh, way you could implement a client like that. You can implement on top of our APIs, you can implement clients any way you want. You can have it like as a native application on Android, like Andrew's doing, or you can have it as a desktop application that you download, and so on. And uh, it always has the same uh, security properties. Well, is there any chance that the browser could lose these, um, this this offline storage, and like, and like if you clear the history and you don't know what you're doing, you click the wrong button, could you lose your local um, so data? The, yeah, the wallet storage is obviously a big topic, and uh, you know I've lost bitcoins myself, uh, uh, mm. so I'm mm. very sensitive to the issue of you know losing coins. Mm. Uh, there's been a very big uh, bitcoin theft, as you all know. Mm -hmm. So um, it's a big topic. How do how do we secure this wallet? And mm -hmm. um, uh, basically, the solution that we've come up with over the last couple of years, and uh, sorry, not last couple of years, but last couple of months. Um, <laughs> Seems like years. And uh, the, <laughs> I have to give uh, some shouts to Gavin, who's been helping with that, and again, Eric and Chris Carter as well. Mm -hmm. um, so these are these are people who have been working on this. Um, and um, mm -hmm. basically, what 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 we've come up with is a two-factor authentication um, that uses the server as the second factor. Um, so you can think of it like. Uh, um, a smart card uh, mm -hmm. type solution, like, like what you would get from your bank, where you right. can actually only do a transaction if you enter your PIN number. Yeah. Right. Um, but what we've done is, instead of having a smart card, we've put the uh, second factor on the server. So um, the way you can think of it is, um, your computer is basically is the smart card, mm -hmm. and the, <laughs> yeah, that's that's a bad way to put it. Um, <laughs> let me just explain how it how it actually works. Okay. There's two factors um, that have to be valid. Screw, screw the metaphors. Screw the okay. metaphors. I'm just going to talk uh, shop now. It's like a buffer so, sticker. So um, basically, there's there's two parts to your private key, right? Mm -hmm. One part is stored on the server, and one part is stored on your uh, local uh, local client. Mm -hmm. um, there's also an encrypted backup, okay, which you can print out, you know, put in a safe, whatever. So. That's how to. That's how we prevent loss. So mm -hmm. if, if something happens to your computer, if something happens to a server, whatever it is, um, you can always get your coins back if you get your backup out of the safe. Right. Uh, we also use a technique um, that was posted on the forums by a guy called uh, G Maxwell, mm -hmm. and uh, it, he basically suggested that instead of generating new keys every time, you can basically generate a master key and then derive our other keys from that. And the advantage of that is that if you have that master key. Um, no matter how many keys you generate later, you don't have to update your backups. You, your backups will stay current. Wow! Um, so I so heard that's that. that's another technique that we're using. So you can basically print out your master key. You can put it in that's a safe. Nice. You can print it out again. Put it in a safety deposit box uh, at the bank, and uh, you're absolutely protected against loss. There's no way, as long as any of these copies survives, um, you're protected. And obviously, you gotta make sure that these things don't get stolen either. That um, blows my mind. I hadn't heard about the idea sorry? of deriving mo more keys from a master key. I, I hadn't read about that. That's I don't even understand how that happens. Um, yeah, you can search on the forums. It's under uh, deterministic wallet, I believe. Wow. And again, it's not my idea. I just uh, grabbed it and implemented it into our stuff. Wow. Okay. That blows my and mind. Things happen so fast. And that's yeah, a free. Again, that's uh, a free example open source. Free culture, right? Yeah. Exactly. So okay, so go on. So, okay, okay, so that's how that's how we protect against loss. Now, mm -hmm. how do we both make it convenient to access and secure against theft, right? right? So, for example, you've got that client on your mobile phone. Your mobile phone gets stolen by somebody who's really, really good with technology, and he can like read all the memory out and hack your PIN number or whatever. So, you know, we can consider that we consider the mobile phone could be completely compromised if somebody steals it. Right. So, we can't actually store the wallet on there. Right. But you don't really want to type in a, a cryptographically secure password or, or key every time you log on because a cryptographically secure password has to be quite long. Okay? Mm -hmm. So we use a little trick. So we have a, a longer key on the server, which the server only sends you after you enter a PIN number. Okay? Mm -hmm. And the key itself is completely useless without the encrypted copy of your wallet that's on your mobile phone. Mm -hmm. So in order to access your wallet, you have to enter the PIN number. If you don't know the PIN number, then you've got maybe 10 tries, for example. And if you run out of those tries, then your wallet locks itself. And the data on the mobile phone is completely useless because you don't have the data that's on the server. Wow. Okay. And your Bitcoins so, are useless, too. You can't get into it at all. You can't get right. into your wallet. So, so, exactly. what, so Citibank so needs can, to hire sorry? you guys. Sorry? Citibank needs to hire you guys. This is more advanced than any security I've heard of for any kind of online banking. Well, he's not finished, uh, but 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I guess we're pushing, pushing at the at the edges a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> That's amazing. I mean, and, it's, but it's, let me finish. Let me finish my yeah, explanation real quick. So yes. Um, so you can at any time access the the wallet for the server with just your PIN number as long as you have your client pre-installed. Now there's a couple of cases. Oh. So for example, you lose your PIN number, you forget your PIN number, how do you get your wallet back? Well, you've still got your backup in your safe, so you can always get back to the master key, enter that, and it'll unlock everything again, okay? So that's how you get it back if you, if you lose your mobile phone or if you have to, um, uh, if for some reason you lose your PIN number and you get locked out yourself. Right. Um, the other thing that can happen is obviously you want to install it on a new device, so you got your new, brand new mobile phone, you want to get your wallet on there. Um, so again, you go back to the master key, um, you can take it out of the, the safe, and uh, you enter it on the, on the new phone, it'll hook everything up so you can use your wallet um, without a hiccup. Um, one more thing, we can probably make some sort of wallet transfer so you don't have to go back to the backup, uh, mm -hmm. as long as you have the PIN number and one device that already has the wallet on it. But that's not, uh, you know, that's far from implemented right now, so. Wow, so this is all one thing. You're talking about a browser-based Bitcoin app slash client that um, also secures your wallet, encrypts it, protects it, moves it from device to device. If you, <laughs> it's it's like so much in one. So your your wallet is it actually living on your phone? If you're using your phone, I mean, it's split between it's split between basically. Um, you you have to think of it as two copies, right? You have mm -hmm. one copy that's split between the server and client. Okay and one copy that's split between the client and your safe, if you will. Okay. Right? Okay. So if you have, if you have, oh actually, sorry, no, 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 let me go back on that. Um, you have two copies. You have one copy that's uh, stored between server and client, and you have one copy that's stored in your safe. So mm -hmm. if you have either the client and the server corporation through mm -hmm. the PIN number, yeah. you can access it, or if you have access to your backup, you can also access it. So can I, um, can I, uh, what am I, transparently switch from my laptop to my desktop to my phone and access it in all three places at all times? Yeah. Because, because it doesn't matter which one, I can, have a, I can have it on each of those things and on the server, and as long as I have, any, I have two of those, I can access it. Yeah, as long as you have uh, internet access, obviously, mm -hmm. um, you can access it. You have to have it installed, uh, as I mentioned, you, know, you have to have the master key to install it, mm -hmm. but once it's installed, you only need the PIN number, and the internet access, basically. And mm -hmm. it'll be synchronized across all your devices, just you know, normal cloud hosting like you're used to from, from Google and so on. Mm -hmm. And then, um, you know, obviously you have to have an account on this site, on this service as well, because that's what makes it work and that's what makes the backup happen. Um, yep. Does the site, and the site, this, the site is operated by you? Um, uh, we have made everything, I've just talked about, um, the stuff that's implemented already, that's open source. Mm -hmm. um, most of the wallet stuff uh, is still in development. Mm -hmm. Right now we're sort of working on the server side, um, but uh, the client side is pretty much done. So you can, again, you look at the screencast and you can pretty much see where we're at or where mm -hmm. we were at a few weeks ago. And uh, I'm hoping to release the first beta of the client where people can play around with it in uh, the next couple of weeks. And just to be clear then, the the administrator of the site that maintains this and, and it has the backup and all that, um, is there any way that they have access to your wallet? Um, so again, the, the wallet is split between the server and the client. Mm -hmm. And the client never gives up its part. Um, okay, now it gets pretty complicated, but um, no, the server does not generally have access to your coins. Um, in the pure web app version, okay, so basically the first version that we're gonna come out with, mm -hmm. um, yes, the server could send you a corrupted version of the software. It's kind of like if the Bitcoin developers snuck something into the code and sent you that, mm -hmm. then they could make it so your wallet just sends all the Bitcoins to that developer, for example, mm -hmm. right? Um, and the way that's prevented is just that people look at the code and if somebody tried to do that, it would be pretty obvious and be, it would be detected pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of the same thing. So if the, the web server tried to do that and tried to steal your coins that way, you'd notice it. Mm -hmm. But that only applies to the web app version. In mm -hmm. all the other versions where you have a client that you download, for mm -hmm. example, the Android version, right. um, it actually, it's the same as with the official clients. Like somebody will review the code long before it actually ever gets to your phone. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, 100 people will have seen it. Mm -hmm. And if there was anything in there, it would send the coin somewhere, uh, somebody would have noticed by then.
Okay. Mm -hmm. And then the backup copy that you referred to, that extra separate backup copy that's on the server, that's also encrypted, and so the administrator of the site wouldn't have access to it without you. Right. Um, so uh, since, since I noticed that, or since I learned about the uh, deterministic wallet idea, mm -hmm. uh, it's actually possible to just encrypt that master key and uh, print it out, and then you don't have to store the backup on the server at all. So, yeah. Wow. And so if someone gets a hold of this master key, they don't have the pin, so they can't do anything with it. Uh, if they, no, no, if they get the access to the actual hard copy of the master key, they have access to the wallet. Everything. Okay. Because that's sort okay. of the backup of your wallet. You have to have you know, tight physical security around that. So right. definitely okay. something like a bank uh, uh, you know, secure deposit box or something like that. Hmm. OK, that still blows my mind, the idea of this deterministic uh, master key thing. It's like, mm -hmm. wow. So you can just create any. I don't, I don't understand that. I'm going to research yeah. more about that. But you, you, can, you can create any number of, of uh, keys that you need. Yes. Um, basically, so what you do is, and that's going slightly uh, in a different route than what G. Maxwell's original idea was. But mm -hmm. um, the way I sort of envision it is, let's say you are a merchant, right? And you want to accept Bitcoins. Um, so you've got your master key. Mm -hmm. And then you've got a... Um, uh, sort of a sort of a, 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 let's say you have your master key and then you've got the SHA hash of that and that's what you store on your public facing computer and then that can be used um, to to generate more keys um, you, you're putting me a little bit honest but I don't <laughs> I don't want to uh, go into the cryptographic details right that's now okay. because uh, again I'm, I haven't implemented yet so I've got like separate uh, models floating around in my head so <laughs> like I go yeah. into one model and I'm like no <laughs> maybe get this model so I don't want to go into too much detail but basically yeah. what you can do is you can generate new addresses mm -hmm. um, on uh, the uh, on a, a server that's later not able to spend money on those same addresses right. because um, in uh, elliptic curve cryptography, you basically have these, these points, these elliptic curve points, mm -hmm. and your private key is a scalar, and your public key is a point, mm -hmm. and uh, you arrive at the public key by uh, multiplying your private scalar with uh, a fixed uh, sort of constant point, mm -hmm. and then you arrive at your public point. Mm -hmm. And um, if you take two private keys and you, I think, add them together, uh, and then you take two public keys and you add them together, um, you get a new private key and a new public key that are um, contingent or, or you know, relate to each other. Um, so you can have one private key on your private server, you can have one private key on your public facing computer, you can have your normal public key that is also on the public facing computer and then the public facing computer can generate as many keys as they want, multiply them together to get a new public address and receive money on that address without actually having the private key, the second private key that they need to spend it. <laughs> so I, I know this is probably super confusing. Whoa. So um, just you We've know, just made read a few up on it if you're interested explode. in the cryptography. Yeah. But what it allows you to do is you have your merchant server, and even if the merchant server gets hacked, uh, the hacker does not have access to any of the bitcoins that server has received in the past. Okay, uh, uh, you know this. Uh, mm -hmm. The the uh, this this may be another stupid question, but <laughs> <laughs> if if um, if the machine can take a public, I mean a private and a public key, right? And then create new private and public keys that are valid based on those, is sort of what you're saying, mm -hmm. then that are usable. Then uh, I have a new pair of private and public keys and then that I can use. Couldn't, what's to prevent someone else from doing that? Well, I guess they have to have the private key to begin with, right? Can um, I answer my own question? <laughs> Right, right, right. So what someone else can do if they have your sort of master public key is they can also generate public keys to uh, where you can receive money, right? Mm. But what mm. they can't do is actually spend your money because they don't have your master private key. They only oh, have your master like public key. So oh, so they oh, can like create that. new they can create new public keys that I can receive money, and my original private key will al uh, allow me to spend that. Exactly. Oh my gosh. That's cool. Yeah. So you don't need a key it's ring at yes, all. You only need one uh, private. Normally, in elliptic curve property, you have one point, right? Mm -hmm. And the, all we're doing is sort of two points. We take two points and we sort of uh, add them together to get a new point. Mm -hmm. And then that has the properties of both original points. Wow. So you can only spend it if you have both private keys. And then so you can you can treat the second private key. I'm not sure if you can treat it completely uh, openly or if you have to keep it secret too, but I think you can treat it completely openly. As long as you don't have the, the first private key, uh, you can't do anything with it. Mm -hmm. Wow. 
And so amazing. Right. If it wasn't confusing enough to the average person, <laughs> right? Yes, I, I'm very sorry that uh, you know I, I, oh, this no. is the first time I'm actually explaining this latest set of it's ideas. It's interesting. Uh, very I'm usually interesting. used to before I go uh, on any shows or anything uh, to to go through a couple times, and uh, that's why it's a little bit. Can you make a two minute animated video about it? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. I wish. For a bounty, for the right bounty, right? Right. Well, I would like to ask about like the user or client side uh, face of it. It seems like it could seem very easy, just a few things. Can you explain a little bit how the interface might look like for like a common user? Right. So the interface uh, right now looks exactly like the, the normal client, pretty much. So you've got basically just a browser-based version of it. Um, you've got your balance, you've got your past history of transactions. And uh, the, where the big differences come in is the stuff that I've de described in terms of wallet handling. Um, so when you open it for the first time, it'll basically ask you, do you want to create a new wallet or do you want to uh, install an existing wallet on this new computer? And then if you choose create, then it'll generate all the keys. It'll give you this page that you can print out and put in your safe, which is your backup. And, uh, uh, and then pretty much you're set up. And then from, from that point forward, you can generate uh, Bitcoin addresses and receive money and send it out again. Mm -hmm. And the other option, if you're already a, a user of the system, uh, what you would do is you choose the other option. I want to install an existing wallet. And then it, if it's a mobile phone, it would ask you to scan the QR code with the private master key. Mm -hmm. um, and then you would do that, and then it would be installed. Uh, or if it's on a PC and you don't have access to like QR code, you would have to type the, the, um, the entire key, basically, which is, um, I think it's something like 20 or, or 25, I guess. Um, uh, characters. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. So, would you recommend using this, like if, like if I was traveling in, in Europe and went to Internet Cafe, and I was able to download this client, <laughs> like would would I still be able to use it, or would you not recommend it? Um, well, obviously, whenever you're on a compromised platform, so example, you're on a computer and the computer has a Trojan installed, or you're at an Internet Cafe and the Internet Cafe owner obviously has admin access to that. Uh, or your mobile phone, and there might be in the future more sort of mobile phone-based hacks or, or mobile phone-based Trojans. Right. Um, as soon as you're on a completely compromised platform, the second we actually um, get to the private key, that's in memory, and any Trojan can read that out. So that's still sort of a limitation. Mm -hmm. um, you have to be sure that at the time you're logging in, your um, uh, system is secure. If you can guarantee that, it's fine. If, if somebody hacks in later, um, they won't get anything. You yeah. know? So it, it, as it is right now, if, if somebody gets your old hard drive or whatever, it doesn't matter. Um, so it's just they have, to, they have to have access or control over your system as you're logging in. And so, so for the web interface version as well, obviously, because they're capturing the keystrokes. Yeah, they would work the same exactly. way. So yeah. the, the, basically, the idea is that um, any, anything, any system like this that's uh, web-based or app-based, any, any client like this, you, you can't always be a thousand percent sure, as I say, that, um, that there's no keyboard capture virus. I mean, there, you know, any, a Trojan or, or some kind of a security breach could be in anything, in any, any network that, right. that, you know, there could be a packet sniffer and so on. So that you don't, the idea, the basic idea is, it's just like your wallet in your pocket. You don't carry around enough money to buy a house in your wallet. You just carry around what you're going to spend that day for lunch, and dinner, at Starbucks, or whatever. So you, you just right. carry around a small amount that it wouldn't be the end of the world if you lost it. And you know, for uh, for your investment, for your long-term life savings, you, this is not the solution for that. Right. Um, there's two more points that I want to make. Um, the first one is there's absolutely nothing preventing or, or technically preventing hardware-based Bitcoin security solutions. So you could have like a Bitcoin mm -hmm. bank card mm -hmm. and a Bitcoin card reader and all the cryptography would actually take place on the smart card chip. Okay? <coughs> wow. Um, you could have a little device, like I've got a, a little device from my bank that I have to hold up to the screen in order to confirm a transfer. Yeah. You could have something like that. Um, yeah, but if you so want to do a screen, that could be hacked that too. You can have for, for you know, banking login, um, you can have for Bitcoin as well. And then the second point I wanted to make is um, also that there could be Bitcoin banks. So right now, all we've been talking about is we want to maintain the original Bitcoin idea of you own it like cash, you have it, right? Mm -hmm. But obviously, you can have Bitcoin banks, just like you have banks that take cash uh, and give you a balance on there. So anything that a bank can do, you can also do 
with Bitcoin. It's just that instead of cash, you pay in with Bitcoins into the bank. Mm -hmm. So those are just two different models. I'm mostly interested in the one where it is like cash. You can you have the control of it. Nobody else does. Right. But everything everything with Bitcoin can also be you know replicated with a traditional model where you have a bank. They take care of it. They insure it. Um, they you know replace it if it gets lost. All this kind of stuff. So yeah. and they give you you know login with the same technology that already exists. Yeah. Um, so so basically you can have both models. It's just that I'm I happen to be interested in this one, right. um, whereas other people are, are working on the other one. For example, my Bitcoin is doing a mm -hmm. great job in the in the sort of being a Bitcoin bank, if you will. Exactly. Yeah. And they're, but they're vulnerable also to keyboard capture viruses. They're both similarly exactly. vulnerable. Exactly. So as soon as you have a bank, then basically instead of you being attacked, it's the bank that could be attacked. Well, yeah. Actually, so, it's two vulnerabilities because yeah, you. I mean, on one hand, your machine could be hacked or a keyboard capture could get the passwords. Uh, for them, it's their site, as we know with Mt. Gox, their site can get hacked and or a keyboard capture can uh, uh, capture your password or a brute force attack, which just means a computer guessing passwords that would, you know, common words or whatever, dictionary words and so on. So you always want to make sure you have a password that doesn't contain words, just l random numbers and letters and characters and so on. Um, I hate to interrupt you, but I want to, I want to thank our sponsors once again. Uh, for making us this uh, whole show possible. Um, please uh, visit their websites and thank them for sponsoring the Bitcoin show. CarpeVM.com, C-A-R-P-E-V-M.com. Seize your market, say it with video, CarpeVM video marketing, and Mezzi Grill, Mediterranean food, where authentic Mediterranean food meets modern flavor, Mezzi Grill, M-E-Z-E Grill.com, and TradeHill.com, of course, Get 10% off life, uh, life of your account, uh, of your trades with the referral code TH-R141, tradehill.com, and usgoldcoins.com, our trusted advisor for excellent investments in rare U.S. gold and silver coins, usgoldcoins.com. Okay, so uh, the time just flies. There's so many things to talk about. It's a good thing we made yep. this a daily show because we just, I mean, we figured we sit around and talk about Bitcoin all day anyway. We may as well just air it as a show. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, there's, there's one last thing that uh, we didn't get to mention yet. Yes. Um, it's, it's just a you know, minor announcement. Uh, basically, uh, the team, uh, Bitcoin team, uh, you know, driven by Mike Hearn, uh, has uh, been talking about the forum. And uh, so the way we see it is that Bitcoin Org is going to be sort of the official website where you can get trusted information about Bitcoin. Bitcoin.org. Um, whereas we use coins going to be more the uh, sort of community side where you know you've got bit uh, you know uh, exchange going on and so on, um, and that's why we're going to move the uh, official Bitcoin forum from forum.bitcoin.org uh, mm -hmm. over to forum.weusecoins.com. That's the only change. It's still going to be hosted by the same people. I don't have access to it even, um, so mm -hmm. you know nothing's going to change really about the forum. It's just that. Um, it's going to be moved over to a different domain because you know we've had a lot of problems with press thinking that you know some random forum uh, uh, message was like the official opinion yeah. of, of our team. So, so absurd. Um, you know that that obviously doesn't work. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that because I had read yeah. about that thread. That uh, so basically the idea is Bitcoin.org will be the official source for all things official from the Bitcoin project, and then WeUseCoins.com will be the domain for the users, the user community, the user forums and all that so that there's no confusion. Yeah, I, I read that because the press was quoting some random person from the forum and saying, well, this was posted on the official site. Exactly. It's ridiculous. It's, it, as soon as you have you know, some stuff like uh, Silk Road, you know, and then associate yeah. with the idea of fish. I mean, Silk Road is used by what, like 0.5% of our users. And uh, it's just, it's just really annoying to, to, you know, to be mm -hmm. put into the same category as, as, you know, some of the stuff that, you know, some random person uh, posts on the forum. So I think that's, that's, that's good important. enough reason to say, all right, we're going to keep the forum as it is. It's fine. It works great. But uh, we don't want it, you know, that prominently or, mm -hmm. you know, right there on the official website with the official name on it. Right. Mm -hmm. I love the, um, the, the way that, the, that everything is happening in lightning f speed. I mean, you can't even read the forum. It's so much happening so fast. Exactly. It's, it's, yeah, it's, that's why we need to talk about it every day. Yeah, the other thing is the, about the forums that I wanted to mention was that there really should, we were, Bruce and I had been talking about that there really should, really should be like a separate forum for developers as opposed to common users um, because if you know I'm a developer I want to go somewhere where you know I can read some good stuff there is a development mailing list that's been set up recently it's uh, on the sourceforge project for Bitcoin uh, it's I think Bitcoin development 
at lists.sourceforge.net. Mm -hmm. But don't quote me on it. Just go to the SourceForge project and go to mailing list and you should see it. Okay, yeah, so the, the real developers can communicate with all the l less... All the uh, other noise. Less, uh, yeah. yeah it's, it's, it's still sort of, you know, right now not many people are using it, but it is, it's been set up. And so, you know, if you're um, tired of, you know, the forum and, the, you know, some of the trolls that are on there, uh, <laughs> the developers have been moving over there a little bit. Mm -hmm, that's great. What, um, <clears throat> so I, I love this idea of a hardware-based security. Is there, I know that <clears throat> there's a way that they can do a unique time code or something like that, right? Is there a way that you could, because the, 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 it seems like there's one common problem, and that is keyboard capture trojans. If, if there's a way for the virus to capture what you're typing right. in your password, is there a way for a card to completely bypass that? Yes. Um, if you have the private keys only on the whatever hardware solution is, whether it's a smart card or a device, mm -hmm. um, if you have the keys only on there and you actually sign the transactions on there and you have some kind of trusted display that's going to show you, you know, where's the money going to go to, uh, what is the amount, and then you can sort of press a button on the device um, to send it, mm -hmm. then it would be secure because then it would be a matter of hacking that device and the, the device obviously can be made such that it doesn't run arbitrary software. So, so it, um, you, you'd have to have a device that has a display on it and can actually store keys and uh, sign transactions. So it's quite a lot of work to be done, but it's possible. So basically, it's a Bitcoin app, uh, like a hardware Bitcoin app, like a dedicated device that is your Bitcoin app and everything all in one? Uh, you know, you would probably use your, you know, a regular app, you know, like, uh, you know, like ours or some other app, um, and it would communicate with this device through some, uh, some channel, and the channel doesn't have to be particularly secure because mm -hmm. when you actually, before you actually acknowledge the transaction, or when you actually, before you actually give the final okay for it, mm -hmm. um, you can see on the display exactly what the transaction is. So the right? secure part, the real, real secure part could be on a physical card. Could it be like the size of a credit card? Um, again, you need a secure display as well. So yeah. if it was a card, you would have to have a card terminal as well mm -hmm. that has a display on it. Mm -hmm. um, because if you don't have a display, then whoever is hacked into your system, uh, if it's on your computer monitor, they can just change whatever it's, is displayed and you'll give your okay and it'll just send it somewhere else than it's Maybe set. a thick card. Um, so you have to have a secure, <laughs> secure display associated with it. Mm -hmm. um, but if you have that, then yeah, it's, it's basically going to be hardware-based security around that I think I, I could have sworn I've seen some sort of a new credit card device that actually has some sort of a display. So yeah, so you hear that developers, you've got your hardware developers out there. Uh, this is what's needed. We need a what's needed list. We need a wiki of, of things that are needed. This is, that's a brilliant idea. I, think, I can see that being the future. Who knows? It could yeah, be uh, like a real I think that uh, there's Super a lot secure. of uh, hardware out there already that could be changed in a mm -hmm. little bit um, mm -hmm. that actually would make this possible. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, that's that. I'm not. That's not my field or anything. But uh, I think that you know, if somebody is already in that sort of area and or a company um, mm -hmm. and they already have like smart card devices, smart card solutions, security tokens, one-time password type stuff, that they might be able to to sort of you know, rig something up pretty cheaply and without much yeah. development effort. So I don't know, but I, I, there's definitely a lot of work to be done in that area. Wow, we, history in the making. You're, you're watching it happen every day. So much is happening. So we're out of time. Thank you so much for joining us, Stefan. Yes, thank you, Stefan. All the way from... <laughs> Lots of love. <laughs> from uh, Switzerland. And what city are you in over there? Uh, I'm uh, in Schindelegi, which is... Uh, uh, you know, population 600 or something. Oh, of course. Uh, but it's, uh, it's uh, near Zurich. So, uh, you know, that <laughs> Lake Zurich over there, and it's, it's beautiful. I've it's got John Matonis nearby. <laughs> so. um, nice. We'll come and visit, wow. for sure. Nice. All right. Well, thank you guys for joining us, and we'll thank see you. you. Thanks for having me. Same yes, time thank tomorrow, you. 2 p.m. Eastern. All right, great. Take care.